Right, good evening, everybody. Um, nice to see so many people here uh, for our event this evening, which is a nice event um, organised by the Institute for Creative Enterprise, which is one of the university's three research institutes. And uh, my name's Roger Shannon, and I'm the director of ICE. Uh, the event is part of the university's Festival of Ideas, which is taking place for um, most of the month, February, with various events happening on campus uh, discussing health, culture and society. And the um, initial prompt for the Festival of Ideas was to consider the legacy of Professor Stuart Hall, the leading uh, multiculturalist theoretician who died a few years ago. And after a tribute to Stuart Hall on campus, the idea of having a festival of discussions that's concentrated on an interdisciplinary nature to do with culture, society and health was proposed. And now we're well in, uh, in the throes of that festival. And I'm very pleased this evening that we have two speakers uh, in conversation who will be discussing the creative industries. Before I introduce them, I'd just like to point out from a recent report uh, published early this week by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, which reported that the creative industries contributed £84 billion pounds to the UK economy in 2014, um, showing that the creative economy is growing twice as fast as the rest of the UK economy, with particularly the industries of film, TV, radio, video and photography increasing by 14%. So I was pleased to see photography doing well there, which obviously augurs well for the future careers of Brooklyn Beckham. These figures are also showing a rise of 7 billion on previous years, whilst also revealing that jobs in the creative industry grew by 9%. Um, show, uh, actually, that's double the pace of development of the rest of the economy. So tonight, um, we have Professor Kate Oakley, on my far right, who is a leading UK writer and researcher into the creative industries. Kate's a Professor of Cultural Policy at the University of Leeds, and her research interests include the politics of cultural policy, work in the cultural industries, and regional development. Her recent books include the 2014 Cultural Policy, co-written with David Bell, and in 2015, Culture, Economy and Politics, the case of New Labour, which provides a major contribution to our understanding of the policy, the politics, culture and the arts via a case study of New Labour's approach to the creative economy. Kate's a Liverpudlian, and she's joined in conversation by another Liverpudlian, Eddie Berg. Eddie Berg is now a creative consultant, but until recently he was artistic director of the BFI South Bank. He's also the founder of FACT in Liverpool and was its first chief exec. Before that, he set up Moviola and the groundbreaking festival Video Positive in Liverpool. He's also chair of ICE's external advisory group and a member of ICE's Northern Powerhouse and Film Policy Group. So, Eddie and Kate have been in conversation till 7.30 with some questions either throughout or at the end. Thanks. Cheers, Roger. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so we've got until about half seven, which is about 50 minutes from now. So we're going uh, to whiz through some... I'm going to whiz through some questions with Kate, but I'm just going to try and get kind of underneath some issues that are set out in her book. Now, um, Kate's book is... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big tome, isn't it? <laughs> Kate, it's a big tome. Uh, it's also an expensive tome, uh, relative. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, these things are all a bit re all relative, aren't they? So, um, but uh, who's, who's, who's read a bit of the book? Phil Drake has read a bit of the book, right? <laughs> Outside. There is, um, the, uh, no one has read all of the book, which is great, because you, you could just recite from the book, if you want, but actually we're going to we're sort of going to interrogate some aspects of the book in a bit of detail. So, look, as Roger said, you know the whole creative industries narrative as is really extraordinary at the moment. 
and um, we're going to look at where that, uh, you know, how we've got here in a sense, because the because um, if, if we just take those numbers that DCMS came up with, uh, which published last week, then during the course of this meeting of this event, the the creative industries will have generated ten million pounds for the economy. So there's a kind of bunch of people out there who are doing some really good work apparently, and um, so. This is, this is the kind of scale of, uh, of investment and growth around the creative industries that I suppose uh, that New Labour could only have dreamt about when it, when it started to kind of formulate the creative industries narrative. But we're going to look at what that means, uh, uh, you know, in, in a bit. So, uh, but one of, one of the kind of most significant things over the last, uh, last few months is that uh, now that the creative industries narrative has been formed in... In, a, in quite a particular way, even the even the chancellor is is a fan, and I and I kind of want to I want to read out what what um, George Osborne said at the, uh, when he read the when he delivered the autumn statement because it is kind of significant in many respects what he said. He said one of the best investments we can make as a nation are the arts and creative industries. He also said, a billion a year in grants leads to a quarter of a trillion pounds for the economy, not a bad return. And then he kind of put a seal on it. And this is, I think this is a kind of very significant thing to say, which is cuts to the sector would be a false economy. And this, uh, this has been a kind of you know, central debate, which we're gonna come back to in, in the conversation. So even the, the, ch the outgoing chairman of the Arts Council, Peter Bazalgett, said was, uh, he, uh, at the time, this is an astonishing landmark settlement for the arts. So in real terms, it's cut, because in real terms, over the life of the, the CSR, the Com Comprehensive Spending Review, it's a real terms cut of about 5%. But the settlement in relation to everything else that was going on is really extraordinary, extraordinary. So, in the context of the the sort of austerity framework, so um, and we're going to hear more about where you know how we've uh, about the overall kind of investment around the arts uh, over the last uh, twenty years, because where we've come to, where we've gone from, where we've come to, and and start to kind of position this uh, a little bit more. But you know, speaking as someone who was you know, has been running or, or very active or around the whole cultural debate over the last 25 years or so. Um, that, you know, I suppose that one of the characteristics of, of, the, of the kind of new Labour period was what, you know, people came to call the sort of, the, the sort of Faustian pact, you know, between, you know, you would, there was an increased amount of money for um, for cultural activity of one sort or another, and, and the actual stats are really quite imp incredible. Um, but obviously, that came with with a pri at a price. It came with a kind of uh, set of expectations about delivering on other agendas and other other policies, which again we're going to hear about shortly. So we want to sort of explore how we've got here, how we've got to this point, and what. Um, what the, uh, what the uh, so I'm going to talk to Kate about some of the contexts uh, that, that, re, uh, that in which uh, New Labour were responding to when they developed their uh, initial cultural creative policies. Uh, we're going to talk more, a bit more about what those policies are, what succeeded, what the legacies of all of this are. Uh, and what role did New, new Labour play in creating and shaping the, the current cultural policy landscape? Before we hear from Kate, though, um, I think let's look at something for a few minutes. So we're going we're to look at a clip of something uh, that was actually on TV recently. But I think it gives some useful clues to, uh, to some of the things that were in the air before New Labour got into power and that perhaps in certain ways were advanced in the, in the first term of the New Labour government in terms of sets of ideas. Um, so 
I am going to do the tech on this, hopefully. Britpop was a particularly British media creation, which included everyone from Suede to Paul ah. and Blur to the Cain and Abel of British rock, the Gallagher Brothers, with their band Oasis. I've got caught shut up in that car right now. With them came the perfect storm of politics, music and PR. It's the 19th of February 1996 and the annual Brit Awards are in full flow. And the rather surprising guest of honour was the Prime Minister in waiting, Tony Blair. to Oasis. In 1996, Oasis were at an absolute zenith. People forget how big that band were. So by the time of the Brit Awards, they were front and centre. Indeed they were, and they swept the board winning three awards. Their swagger suggested they'd been enjoying their evening. Queen. The Oasis table, I like to tell my we're on ecstasy. So, no one was out of his mind, do you know what I mean? You know, so they were just like, gone. And it was in this state that Noel gave one of the most surprising speeches in the history of music. Oi, there are seven people in this room tonight who have given a little bit of hope to young people in this country. That is me, our kid, Bonnet, Alan White, Alan McGee, and Tony Blair. And if you don't know anything about it, you get out there and you say Tony Blair's Alan, the man. I mean, it was like, it was a kind of ridiculous statement, but I mean, it was like, but I mean, when you're on ecstasy, you didn't you make ridiculous statements. You just happen to make it in front of like 100 million people watching it. Being endorsed by Noel Gallagher in that environment was an absolute. So what I'm looking for. PR gold sound? Perfect. You should be PR. And the endorsement of the Labour Party by, by Oasis and for Thaipal was big. Do you know what I mean? You know, it, was, it made it cool to be young and vote Labour. But New Labour, knowing they were onto a good thing, wanted more. So one of Blair's inner circle, Margaret McDonough, contacted Alan McGee and his head of PR, Andy Saunders. Margaret McDonough wanted to understand what we did and how we did it. She wanted to understand how you can manipulate popular culture, how you can take popular culture and layer on politics and layer on message. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. She was smart enough to realise that if she used us properly and she used our knowledge and she used our contacts, that she could create something quite special for the Labour Party. By now you should have somehow realised what you gotta do. So the first thing she asked us for was Oasis's database. And we said no can do. And then she said, can you get Noel to do the youth Labour Party conference? So I was like, I doubt it, I'll ask. And then I phoned him and, and he was like, oh fucked man, I'm just back to America. I, I can't do it. Get, get, give him something again, just give him, give him a gold disc or something. So I went with this massive big fucking multi platinum thing to play it. And I went to the Blackpool Youth Conference and I went to Tony Blair. Tony Blair very cleverly used Creation Records as a great example of new labour. It's a, it's a great company, you know, we should be really proud of it. I was just telling me, we started 12 years ago with a thousand quid bank loan and now it's a turnover of 34 million. And that's new labour. So, all you have to remember is everybody is spinning everybody. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, so, Kate, <laughs> um, because in, in, the, in, the, in the book, 
we've got in, in, the, in the book that only Phil Drake has read part of. <laughs> no. But many more well, people well, will well, have done after tonight. Everyone in the room will have read it by the weekend. <laughs> Um, there is um, much, uh, much is made of the relationship or the, the uh, appropriation of, of popular culture uh, in, uh, in terms of the, the, cr the creative industries and, cult and more general cultural narrative at the time by New Labour. Mm -hmm. But what would be really useful for us to understand is, is, that, is to tell us more about the, the sort of wider cultural landscape at that point, the policy landscape around culture. Uh, and to what extent New Labour were drawing on that existing policy landscape in the first term, and to what extent they were starting to look at, as we've just seen, the opportunities around appropriating aspects of popular culture. Okay. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's fantastically, you know, evocative even for me to look at that bit of footage, because I think it's quite important to remember um, now when there's, any, including in our book, a fair degree of kind of cynicism about the new Labour period. The, the sense of a political moment in 97 when they were elected and the sense of, be, of being changed after quite a long period of political stasis and what seemed like uh, an exhausted regime, what seemed like a celebration of nostalgia. John Major had his famous, you know, Elm Lady cycling to whatever it was, even song references. <laughs> there was a lot of, there was a kind of sense of, of um, uh, the past, I suppose, dominating British political landscape. So there was a sense of, it, of a moment, the whole new Labour thing, I think, you know, comes over very kind of strongly in that. And I think that there was um, a way in which that new Labour were, were drawing on what had been happening essentially since the mid 80s in London and other UK cities. So I think that's, that's one of the things that's important to remember. They didn't kind of create this merger of popular culture, um, urban regeneration and public policy. That was happening anyway. It had, had been happening anyway for, for a, in a variety of places. I mean, I think it's important to kind of stress, isn't it, that this, this moment where there was a name change, because just about the, yep. the idea of something that's future facing and something yep. that's that, that, that sort of is nostalgic in a sense. Yes. Because, the, because DCMS, there was, DCMS didn't exist in, there wasn't something called DCMS that existed in 1996 at that moment. It was the Department of Heritage that yep, existed. Indeed. So, you know, it, it was, it, that, that's one, in, one thing that New Labour were responding to. Exactly, yeah. yeah. There was a kind of des desire to associate it with modernity, to associate it with novelty, to associate it with popular culture. But the popular culture thing, I think, came through two sources. So one of them what was already been happening in cities, Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, and obviously with the G under the GLC in London. That was a, a, a strong kind of trope. And also what came through their kind of intellectual lineage, you might call it, in things like Marxism Today and in work that was influenced by cultural studies, by Stuart Hall, by people like Martin Jakes and Jeff Mulgan, all these people who had, you know, spent a long time essentially making the case for the emancipatory pop, you know, potential of popular culture in some ways. And I think that that heritage was also part of that story, really. Uh, and then there was an opportunistic element to it, which was that, you know, there was a sense in which the nation was kind of exhausted. They needed a narrative. They were very keen on, um, it wasn't really called spin, actually. I mean, spin, the term, calling it spin, which obviously comes from the US rather than the UK, came in during the New Labour period. People didn't really speak about it as spin in 96, 97. But the idea of, pr of presentation, which they did get to some degree from um, their experience of overseas and particularly in the US, those kind of things, I think, was, was part of that narrative, part of articulating we are different, we're new, we're not the old socialist, discredited Labour Party, we're not the Conservatives who are mired in nostalgia, we are this different entity in a sense and there's, there's something you talk about uh, you know uh, early on in the book which is about um, uh, the, the the kind of social democratic yeah. traditions yeah. of uh, the positioning of culture yeah. which is often you know the kind of margins mm -hmm. um, but the the sort of impulses the, the competing impulses that uh, between the, the democratization of yeah. culture and cultural democracy yes can you just Talk a little bit yeah. about that. So I think the New Labour inherited from, as I say, partly it's kind of Marxism today, post-structuralist kind of intellectual lineage, and what had been going on on the ground in cities, so these two kind of things. From that it inherited um, a narrative about the potential of popular culture to 
break down barriers in society to allow you know, women, working class people, people of colour, groups that had often been marginalised in our society and in our culture, um, that it offered them a potential to sort of remake the nation in some ways. And I mean, quite a profound kind of way. There was a remaking of cities going on. There was a sense in which um, the, 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 the kind of almost kind of colonial heritage of Britain was being challenged in some ways. There was an idea of greater diversity. We had sort of Channel 4. We had this kind of idea of a new narrative about Britain, which wasn't just nostalgic, wasn't just backward looking, wasn't just obsessed with the Second World War and had shaken off to some degree its kind of colonial heritage. And I think that in the, in the case of New Labour, that, was, that did have a, a commitment to democratising culture which I understand of as making it more accessible to people, bringing these things, free museums would be a good example of that. That's a democratisation thing. You say, these are our great national treasures, we'll make them free. So that was a you know, new Labour policy. But it, what they were less good at was questioning the nature of, of whose culture and what sort of culture and who, you know, who's being represented. I think they were less good at that side of it, which would have been part of their heritage from something like the GLC. The GLC looked at this both at the point of view of how do people get access to culture, how do they participate, how do they go to things, you know, free festivals, all that sort of yeah. stuff, but also whose voice is being heard. New Labour did the first thing. They were concerned to get more people culturally active, culturally participating, but they were less questioning about the nature of culture itself, I think, in some ways. So, so to, to tell us more about... Um, the, the, the kind of beginnings of DCMS, because obviously this is the first time where the term creative industries yeah. starts to get hardwired into a kind of policy narrative. Yeah. Although it's been kind of kicking around in different yeah, ways. Yeah, it's been kicking around. It, it's been kicking around, but, but it's the first time it's really, you know, been part of a, of an, of a government agenda in that mm -hmm. way. So, so tell us how that came into, into being. Mm -hmm. And what, because in the, in the first term of New Labour, there are actually there are not really many policies as such, uh, but there is, but yeah. tell us what, what yeah. was, you know, what were the key elements of the, you know, the policy framework around yeah. creative industries at that time? Well, remember, there weren't really many policies as such because there wasn't really much money in the first term. They agreed to follow Tory yeah. spending plans. So for the first two or three years, they didn't spend that much money. The money that you spoke about when you, in your intro came later, the kind of yeah. the upping yeah. of, of cultural. So there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of new money for cultural activities in the first, term, or the first been first two or three years, but there was a kind of ground clearing exercise, which as you say was partly about renaming the Department of National Heritage as the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, having a big sort of what became known as a mapping activity, a counting activity to find out how much um, cultural production essentially was going on in the nation, what sort of, you know, let's, let's define these industries, let's say that they create some sort of economic entity, uh, and then let's count them and find out how much of this stuff is kind of going on. And that was, a, I think, in some ways, a classic um, mixture of both directed public policy. There was a longer term commitment coming out of um, people like David Putnam and John Newbigin, who'd worked with him, and, and um, Will Stevenson, and various cultural advisors had been active in the, you know, the pre, in the, in the last years of the Conservative government as advisors to the Labour Party. There was, there was that kind of idea of let's um, recognise the importance of these sectors. We think they're probably growing in importance. We need to somehow name them, make them into an entity and then count them. And then we can say, essentially, they are of greater economic importance. And for Chris Smith, who was the first New Labour Minister, Secretary of State for Culture, um, this whole kind of naming and making this important, making the economic case for these things was what he would describe as the central activity of his first term and what he regarded along with when we interviewed him for the book along with free museums as the you know the best thing that he did so i.e you know for policy you need to name an object you need yeah. to have something for public policy to act upon culture had always been difficult yeah. for all sorts of good reasons and because it was partly because it's kind of fuzzy and partly because governments particularly in britain which has got you know a, a, an arm's length relationship don't like to intervene too much because it's sensitive and politically controversial and those kind of things. So in a way, a policy object had to be created, which could then be acted upon by the policies that came later, really. Because I think one of the things that, um, uh, that the people in the cultural sector often talk about uh, when, they, when they sort of characterise the difference between, let's say, kind of Labour administration, whether it was New, new Labour or 
you know, a previous, a version, <laughs> yeah, yeah. previous version of Labour. Yeah. And um, the, uh, or, or Tory or, co or coalition government is, you know, the, the arm's length principle yeah. during New Labour yeah. got a lot shorter. Yeah, it did. So, so this kind of leads on to this sort of idea that actually a lot of people associated not just with New Labour, not just the, obviously the additional investment yeah. came at a price. Yeah. And that price was what we what came to be called instrumentalism. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So, again, can you give, some, yeah. give us some background okay. to that? And and I kind of I think there is, you know, this is in some ways this kind of can seem like quite a dry subject, but you know the fact is there's a, there's a if you're if you're working in the cultural sector at whatever level, there and you're getting uh, increased investment. The sets of expectations that came with that investment during the new labour period changed, and and they changed in a very interesting way. And so, one of the things I think that's also kind of interesting here is that, you know, the extent to which the cultural sector itself influenced policy yeah. once those, once the Faustian pact yeah. was in place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there was a question. There was there. a question <laughs> some time ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the yeah, question was sort of in instrumentalism, in a sense, yeah, yeah. Where, where that came from. So again, I think, and I think we do try to say this in the book, although whether we say it clearly or not, I can't, now can't, couldn't really say, but all public policy is instrumental, in a sense. There's not much point in having non-instrumental public policy. You presumably want to achieve something by spending money and having a public policy. And cultural policy has always had an instrumental element to it. So New Labour did not invent that. They didn't, they didn't bring instrumentalism into a world that was hitherto untouched by instrumentalism, right? But they did, um, did emphasise it very strongly. And I think they did it partly because of this mixed heritage they got. They had the kind of remnants of a sort of social democratic ideal in there. So they would made this economic story. They'd made this, not made the story, I mean, it was what was happening, but they brought about this, this mapping exercise which showed that the sectors were big and they were growing fast and they were bringing lots of new jobs, etc. So they had an economic story that they could take to the Treasury. So there was an element of economic instrumentalism. So that after that, every story had to be about growth and jobs and investment and there was, that was kind of created. But there was always also alongside that a kind of social story. Labour could never completely drop that side of it, partly because of their own, you know, mm. political heritage. They couldn't just say, "Look, jobs, growth." In a way that, that I think that Osborne somewhat more can, you know. Um, Labour had to have a social story for this as well, and the social story was about urban regeneration. It was again about community development. It was about participation. It was about all the good things that culture is kind of supposed to do to you. Um, and because of the extreme, um, which they've been criticised for, of course, a lot in lots of other, you know, critiques of New Labour, their extreme kind of managerialism. You know, there was a lot of money being spent, but they wanted to know, they wanted to account for it. They were very influenced by the argument that previous Labour governments had not accounted for public spending in the right way, that they were, that this whole kind of new public management, as it was called, you know, the desire to kind yeah. of count things and account for them and give an account of where the money had gone, what the cost benefit analysis was. They wanted to do that and they wanted to do it for culture and they wanted culture to give both economic and social returns, I think. Um, and in return for that, there was a lot of money available for it. So I think it was, you know, I think it was a Faustian pact but not necessarily, um, not ne I think it fell in the sense that I think it had unfortunate outcomes, but it wasn't necessarily undertaken in a cynical way. There is, um, uh, the, the, because the, the first term was, um, as you say, was about adopting sets yeah. of, you know, spending pledges that yeah. have been kind of agreed and so the, the kind of real you know stimulus in terms of investment in the cultural sector came in the from the second term onwards there is um there were obviously some things in that first period that new labor badged but which were actually started in yeah, the previous yeah, administration yeah, 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 like, yeah. So the dome, the, the dome <laughs> most example, famously, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, which is you know a yeah. kind of symbolising, yeah. you know, a future-facing creative. Britain. Indeed. So, so what is the um, what, what, what yeah, because because obviously this is is in a sense is part of the new Labour legacy. Yeah. What, what is what, to what extent was was Labour's um, you know creative legacy hampered by the 
by the, the, do, the perception of the dome? Yeah, it's a really good question. We thought when we wrote the book, we spent a lot of time thinking about, well, I did. Nobody else got very interested in this, but I was quite interested about what we were going to have on the cover. The co the, what we ended up with on the cover is not what I wanted for various copyright reasons. But I, a lot of the time I was thinking about what would you consider to be a quintessentially new labour cultural product? Yeah. I.e. what would be the book or the film or the TV programme? Maybe we can ask the audience, what's a quintessential... <laughs> what do you think... Anybody got yeah. a quintessential... What would you have put on the cover had you a new, not a had new labour, Palgrave? Yeah. Something that said new labour to you. Yeah. This is crowdsourcing the yeah. front cover, yeah? So who, who's, who's got a suggestion? Anthony yeah, Gormley. Anthony Gormley's a good... I, I, we did think about yeah. Gormley. Ge one, yeah. Gentleman at the back. Yeah. Yeah, although Labour tried to kind of disown that we sort did, of... The, did. We yeah. did think about, yeah, yeah. Geezer movies. Geezer movies. You mean Guy Ritchie? What you mean? Things. I see what like his Icelandic geezers. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this the banking crash? Um, <laughs> the, um, the sort of gangster genre that um, seems to be fueled by the availability of the lottery fund. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Geezers. Well, um, exactly. The, the, mm. the Noel Gallagher at, at number 10 with a glass of wine image, the Cool Britannia image. We did think about that. I thought that too cliched is what yeah, I thought. I think, oh, you know, slightly overdetermined. But interesting, that's a kind of turning point, I think. The moment when yeah. they went to number 10 is the moment where the, the kind of it, the, the, it's sh something shattered at that point, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I've, you know, for a lot of people, it was, uh, well, I think for some people, it was a sense that. Um, this is just more of the same, dressed slightly differently. Yeah, there yeah. Is, um, so, but the but the interesting thing here is anybody actually just uh, I've cut people off. There's anybody else got an interesting suggestion for a front cover? Yes. I was going to suggest the image in my head, which is just a Union Jack painted onto a guitar. Okay. Okay. Nice. I said, shall I tell you what the other ones? Nice. Go I did this good. exercise when, when we were thinking about the cover of the book. I did this exercise asking where people. And the t I, two other suggestions I got a lot. One was the Damien Hirst, the gold story, the diamond studded skull, which is right at the end of the New Labour period. I think it was sold during the banking crash, wasn't it? Um, and the other one was my, my favourite one, which I wanted, but we couldn't get the, the rights agreed, was uh, Billy Elliot. Oh, right. Him jumping up, the kid jumping up. Yeah. And everybody thought that was, qu well, the person I discussed it with thought that was quintessential New Labour because it was A, in the North East. It was a story about mobility and aspiration and meritocracy. But it had a sort of soft old Labour heart. Yeah. And I actually think that would have been, should have been the cover. I think that was the story in We some need, ways. need to work on a song for the audio book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, obviously, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, that's that. In a sense, that's kind of part of a part of a kind of an, an, an interesting narrative. Yeah. That there's a kind of unintentional yeah. narrative that, as it were, that came with uh, yeah. a bit later on. Yeah. But there is. So moving on from the from the Labour's first <laughs> term and the sort of you know the potential you know major banana skin as it, you know of the of the dome. Uh, of the dome yeah which i don't really hold them responsible for in a way i mean entirely but but in sense in sense the second term is is uh, in the second term there's there's a lot more money pumped into the cultural yeah. sector i mean the figures are really significant i mean yeah. there's a kind of sleight of hand going on as well at the same time about the way in which local authorities are funded yeah, yeah. Uh, but basically there's a combination of regional a lot more kind of regional Money going to regions, yeah, and um, lottery the, funds, uh, and the and European fund, a lot more. Yeah. The zenith uh, of European, the sort of you know, of of European funding. I suppose um, Liverpool obviously benefited a lot as a having objective one status, um, and um, and the and the amount of money that was going via Arts Council England in England to the cultural sector had increased almost threefold in the space of ten years by the time of the beginning mm -hmm. of the second term. So, uh, plus, as uh, the lottery money was, uh, was, uh, was now beginning to kind of come through at a level that, um, that meant that um, there was the, the whole cultural infrastructure development that could play into the cultural regeneration now, or the wider regeneration narrative. Mm -hmm. So, it, talk us through the second term, because in a, in a way, there's, the second term is where there's a lot more money, mm -hmm. There's, there's other kinds of policy developments going on 
uh, and there is um, uh, and the cultural sector itself is playing a kind of bigger role in the creation of that of that narrative. Yeah, I mean, so the, there are, are other policy. In some ways, I think the fir uh, in a lot of the policy um, things that are going on are the formation of kind of institutions, and there's so, so there was a kind of new Labour formation of in cultural kind of institutions from Nesta to the Film Council. Um, and the cultural consortia. There were lots of different kind of institutional jigsaws that were kind of set up and bodies that were set up to administer this money, particularly at a kind of um, regional level. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure building in the second term. I mean, the, you know, the cultural landscape, I think in terms of, you know, particularly contemporary art galleries, but other things too, of the country was transformed in that period. Lots of stuff was built. Some of that was desperately unsuccessful, some of it, was very successful. A lot of it was kind of in between, which is probably reasonable enough, really. Um, but there was a much stronger, I think, by then, push on on the kind of instrumentalism returns, on the kind of measuring of benefits of one sort or another, economic, social, well-being narrative starts in in that kind of period. The whole idea of kind of well-being, all these kind of things get much more of a kind of formalised, I think, in, in, in that sort of period. Although there is the interesting thing about the kind of Tessa Jowell period. Yeah, it? so, where, where so, was, so, so instrumentalism reaches yeah. a kind of point, the cultural sector complains about being constantly asked to account for things, particularly in terms which it's not very good at accounting for. So a lot of the questions about who goes to things, who gets to produce things, a lot of the questions about inequality, interestingly, which we now dominate, you know, even even media conversations about who works in the cultural industries, why is the Oscars shortlist all white, those kind of questions, were sort of starting to kind of bubble away, I think, in, in those early days, because there was a lot of growth in these sectors. Um, there was a lot of dynamism, but there wasn't the, the story of working class people, people of colour, women, necessarily hugely benefiting from those that growth. It was becoming apparent that that wasn't really the case. That there were inequalities that were kind of remaining, and in some cases deepening. So, so, so I think the cultural sorry. sector, I think, gets a bit nervous at this point. It's slightly yeah. sick of being asked to account for who its audiences are in in a very detailed way, and to give this kind of story about social and economic benefits every time it, it's getting money. But also, I think there was a growing nervousness that, you know, it wasn't really delivering on some of those things. Because, because you know, the question of who the the cultural policy is for yeah. is is interesting. So, you know, ov obviously. What uh, you mentioned before, the free museums, yeah. uh, or, or rather free access to museums, there is, uh, uh, which came in, it was the first term. First term thing, First yeah. term initiative, but actually was only measured yeah. in largely in the yeah, second term. exactly. And um, I mean, I think it's worth saying something about that because that's a, a, it's, a, it's instructive, isn't it? Because it wasn't, it wasn't, the free museums model wasn't universally supported within the cultural sector. No, but, no. Uh, and, uh, and then there are kind of questions uh, about uh, to what extent it, uh, you know, it, it actually drew a wider, yeah. a wider yeah. audience yeah. Yeah. To, to museums. So yeah. do, to, talk us through through that. Because yeah. I think that's a kind of it's an interesting story yeah. in itself. I mean, to some degree, there were certainly some of the big national museums who were opposed to the introduction of free museums. Some of that was about them being concerned that um, they wouldn't be able to manage the numbers which you know you could you could say in some cases has turned out to be the case um uh some of it was um i think you know essentially a sort of you know the great unwashed will be at our doors kind of thing there was a sense in which museums felt the, the big national museums felt that by charging they had a certain autonomy over the money and it regulated the numbers of people coming in and people who wanted to come in kind of came so there was a pushback from them and then new labor did as you know nye bevan said about the introduction of the nhs stuff their mouths with gold in a way i mean they bought them off by saying we'll we will we'll, we'll help you with the kind of vat problem that they had um, and we'll essentially force you to do this. We'll force you to do this kind of essentially social policy, the cultural policy, uh, and we'll, but we'll buy you off so that there's no kind of financial uh, problems there. But there was pushback from those kind of institutions. Afterwards, of course, that's very hard to unearth that story. There are very few national museum directors who will ever tell you they were opposed to, to free entry, but they were at the time. But, but it looks like in the first few years there was a kind of and there di was a, a diversification of audience. Yeah, big but but you know there was like two years ago there was a big piece of work done on London, London's museums where there's free free entry, and the, the fact is, 
the, the, the numbers uh, uh, at, whilst they've sort of stabilised, the, the fact is that what free entry has done in London is, has meant that more tourists go and the people who go regularly go more often. So it's not a, it's not a broader audience. No. No. It's actually enabled tourists to go um, and uh, or a broader range of tourists to go and the people who regularly attend to go more often. So um, you could argue that it's then, it's, it's actually turned out to be a policy that benefits people who least need free, yeah. I mean, you know, free entry. <laughs> yeah, you, you can argue that to some degree about all sort of cultural policies, I think, to some, to some degree. But I mean, it's the same with the, same with the National Theatre, which had a £10 ticket fun funded by Travelex, I think, originally. Yeah. £10 tickets, without the, the evidence was the same, was that the people who would go anyway just went for 10 quid rather than 30 quid or 40 quid or whatever it was. I think, to be fair to them, though, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm fan, a fan of kind of free museums, I think there is something about the experience of going somewhere and knowing that that is open to you as a citizen. It's a bit like the policy that I would compare that to the most is one of the few genuinely progressive pieces of legislation that they passed, I think, which was the right to roam in the countryside. I always think of that as a kind of companion piece to free museums in a way. It's not really about who does it because the people who yeah. roam in the countryside are of a certain type, one could argue. Um, it's yeah. that you're giving, in a sense, citizens some sort of ownership of their own state. We could just check here, who roams in the countryside? <laughs> oh, there's quite a few people who roam in the countryside. I roam in the countryside. And who, who are, uh, uh, so I'd say about a third of the, of the audience roam in the countryside. There you go. Nice. And, um, <laughs> and how many of you go, let's say, once a month or more uh, to, uh, to a museum where there is a free access to a collection or collections. Or once a month, did you say? Once, once a month a or more. So that's tiny. Three, four, <laughs> four, five maybe. Um, so that's about 20% of you. So there's more roamers <laughs> than museum goers in this, in this audience. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> you could you could roam in the museum, <laughs> yeah. So um, okay, so obviously the the big event of the third term is the is the crash, right? I mean the big the world world event, world yeah. events yeah. of, uh, and uh, and obviously that you know led to uh, a series of other crises, not least you know a, a sort of um, a, a, a set of challenges for the cultural sector mm -hmm. in making mm -hmm. arguments for investment yeah. at that time, yeah. um, or the level of investment. Yeah. What, 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 explain to us what happened in that period to, to the, the creative industry's narrative, which had had this sort of, for many people, there had been a sort of golden age of investment. Yeah. At the very least, regardless of whether you thought it was a golden age in terms of cultural output, it was, there was a kind of golden age of investment. There'd be nothing like it from yeah. the, historically at that scale from the public purse. Yeah. But here was a kind of, you know, an unprecedented moment yeah. um, e uh, economically. Yeah. What, what, was, what was happening to, cult to the cultural policy during that period? Well, one of the things that I, I think that one of the things to say is that the tap gets turned off slightly before I mean, it worked fairly early on in the crash. So the golden period of spending is probably about 2003 to 2008, something like that. So quite early in the crash, before New Labour finishes in 2009, the, the, the public spending tap gets turned down a bit in terms of culture. Um, but what I was, I was struck by at the period of the crash and, and immediately afterwards was how relatively precarious that New Labour legacy in terms of institutions and bodies turned out to be. Uh, so w regional development agencies, for example, who'd spent a lot of money on culture and been very active, were sort of gone overnight in the famous bonfire of the Quangos. You know, the film council, mm. gone. A few people wrote a letter to the, to the paper, a little bit of complaint about it, but, you know, nobody up in arms. Nesta almost went, there wasn't, didn't. There wasn't civil unrest. There was not civil the unrest in any of these things. These institutions had had down. a lot of yeah. money, but actually not just, not just the film council. I think oh, the yeah. cultural sector, in a sense, didn't, it's, I mean, subsequently, things like, you know, closing public libraries, those kind of things, that brings people, I mean, literally onto the streets in some cases and gets people very kind of active. But the 
the sort of collapse of that new labour infrastructural set of things that had, that, had, that had been there, that kind of, you know, that was buoyed up by public money, that collapsed pretty quickly and there wasn't a lot of outrage about that. There wasn't a lot of pain felt. And there was something about, I think, about that, and it's interesting because I think it's true in other areas of new labour policy as well, there was a lack of stickiness about it. I mean, you can virtually, you know, if you look at other, including labour uh, institutions, the Open University, you know, uh, the BBC, obviously, you can hardly move the Radio 4 schedule without people getting upset about it. But the new labour legacy was somehow very precarious. Yeah. It was buoyed up by a lot of public money. It had buy-in while it had a lot of public money. And then when it was gone, not many people seemed to mourn it. Yeah. And I yeah. think there's something, there's something interesting in that. I mean, I think people mourn the fact that they didn't no longer got grants to do stuff, but they didn't mourn the new labour of a cultural legacy in some way. Well, let, let's, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit more about legacy, but you know, before we do that, I want to ask the audience um, what you think, you know, just kind of one thing that, you, that for you sort of is, exemplifies uh, Labour's cultural legacy. What, what is it? What, is, this, is this something that you think about um, that is, um, is the legacy of all of that investment, all of that reframing of cultural and uh, creative activity um, over, over 13 years? Anybody got any suggestions? No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because these, are, yes, these are the things. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's a key thing that, that people reference. Um, any gentleman over over there? Um, lots of working class kids going to university. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Do you yeah. do you think there's a was there a higher proportion of working class kids going I'm to uni sure, but I know university I during that period? Aware of the option of going to university, as were a lot of my friends. Um, I yeah. Think that's yeah, well, the massive expansion of higher education, so that's, maybe, that's true. Uh, in terms of Labour's cultural legacy, you might call it short-lived, or whether that was the intention, I'm not really sure. Yeah. OK, uh, and this, this um, gentleman here? Um, I could be wrong, so I'm not an expert in this area, but it seemed like a lot of places that didn't have cultural assets had the opportunity to develop them. Mm -hmm. And um, gentlemen over here. Yeah, I suppose just where we are tonight as well, because the increasing number of universities that came about through the Labour government, mm -hmm. and then the increasing number of courses in creative media and so on, that came out from the government to study journalism here. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother back in 2001 studied photography at Gloucester, so there wasn't the same opportunities for sort of creative industries in, in Ireland that people mm -hmm. were looking to the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that and this is interesting in terms yeah. of the kind of cultural cultural policy and education yep. policy yep. and whether there was an there was sort of unexpected consequences yep. as it were yep. of that i mean what what i mean yep. it's interesting these points about yeah yeah no absolutely i agree access, i agree in a sense you know the traditional access tensions if you like in in culture are are about you know excellence alongside access you know how to balance that sort of idea of you know you you, you know you're there to be to, in the sort of Matthew Arnold sense of doing the kind of the very best that you can kind of, you know, that's said and done, uh, you know, to, uh, alongside the opportunity to connect people who wouldn't normally engage with, with that, whatever it is, um, to create the pathways for those, those people to connect with what it is you're doing. So that, that sort of during the labor, new labor mm. period, there was, you know, there was much made of that, that kind of balancing. Yep, indeed, indeed. And 
Uh, and so it's interesting to see w what the interplay then was with mm. education. Yeah, I mean, what's, yeah. What's I mean there was, again, that? it's a third term, uh, to some degree, a kind of Gordon Brown thing. There was creative partnerships, of course. So there was an attempt, a very conscious attempt, to drive much more activity in terms of schools and uh, um, art education and to link that again to this kind of creative industry thing. But I think people are right to pick up on the expansion of higher education. It is a, it is a legacy of that period. I mean, higher education did expand hugely in the UK in that period. But there's also, in the classic sort of new labour way, that the fees were also introduced in that period, the, you know, the, uh, not at the level they are now, but nonetheless the idea of, of you paying for what became a sort of personalised good, rather than a sort of social investment, uh, as it had previously, I think, been, been sort of yeah. seen. So I think there was, yes, again, it was, there was an expansion but it came at a cost, and the cost was that it introduced um, um, fees. But I also think it comes back to this issue that you were talking about at the beginning about Osborne and the fact that the arts were, I mean, uh, you know, an incredibly politically neutered arts, which might be one of the legacies of New Labour, that we do have an incredibly supine art sector, it seems to me. The fact that everybody leapt up in absolute joy, the fact that Osborne didn't take every single penny from them, is a signal of that, I think, because in fact, um, the majority of the money, the majority of the things that really have an influence on the cultural life of the nation aren't from cultural policy. And the fact that, you know, that, 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 that university education is now being essentially made something for the kind of wealthy, the absolute eradication of things like educational maintenance allowance and things like that. These things have far more impact, really, on, on our cultural lives than, you know, what the, the tiny bit of money that Osborne has saved to give to Manchester or the Borough Collection. Of course, and of course the other side of the story with, with um, the, the autumn statements is that, you know, local authorities have got 40% well, cuts yeah, over five yeah. years. And now so half of them now have no arts and cultural and, provision. And local authorities provide um, more money to, oh, as a whole yeah. to the cultural sector than the Arts Council does uh, by, I think, about twice the amount. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So currently, but that will be the same in three years' time. So before, before we go on to kind of looking just finally around where, um, you know, it, to a certain extent, where we are now, yeah. and, to, and to, to kind of understand more about uh, how new Labour's policies have influenced where the point at wh where we're at, yeah. just um, it'd be great if, we can, if you've got some, some questions for Kate to either ask the, uh, those questions now or to prepare one for a, a couple of minutes time. So has anybody got a, a question they'd like to, to ask Kate? Yes. Hi Kate, um, I was uh, interested, uh, that was really interesting actually, and um, I think it's kind of summarized that, that huge period um, really well. Um, but coming to a more recent period, I, I was thinking of your 2016 paper where you discuss the um, inequalities between yeah. the producers of culture and consumers of culture. Yeah. It would be quite interesting to hear um, what you say about that in the you know, context of these cuts and so on and so forth. And yeah. there's this sort of narrative about a northern powerhouse, yeah. but again, um, fraught with inequalities in, in its design. So yeah. I'd just like to hear your views on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things that... Um, I say about the kind of fragility of the new Labour legacy was that a lot of those kind of issues weren't really challenged. I think there was an attempt to do it. I think for things like creative partnerships, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not utterly critical. I think there was an attempt to address some of those issues about access and who gets to do these things. But I think that there was also a complacency, particularly in terms of production, actually. So there certainly was a sense. I mean, it's in really interesting in that bit of footage where Blair says about, um, when he's talking about creation records, and he it says, they made 10 million quid, that's new labour for you. Yeah. You know, that whole thing about being relaxed yeah. about the filthy rich that, that, that Mandelson famously that said. Was a, that was a sign. That, that was, was a sign. A, it was, was a sign, sign that in yeah. a way that there was a commitment to um, access, it was a commitment to sort of meritocracy, but there was no commitment really to challenge wealth in a way. There was no commitment to really challenge kind of hierarchies. And I think that's, we're living with some of that. So that these sectors now, you know, they do employ lots of people. They do attract huge numbers of people who want to work in them. You know, I teach them, um, want to work in them, want to, the, you know, the cultural production is, is at a, you know, I suppose a kind of all time high. I, I think the way they count nowadays is 
slightly dodgier than it used to be, actually. But besides that, no, they're, they're clearly growing. Well, within they're, whether they're, No, no, no. Within, <laughs> within the DCMS, because I'm always changing the way they do it. Whether they're growing at 9% or, you know, they're clearly growing. There, there is something. But, you know, the, the, the squeezing of, of higher education, the turning of it into a kind of market, and a relatively expensive market these days, all these kind of things have essentially made meant that it, they are, you know, whiter, more male and more middle class even than the rest of the economy. And that in most cases, they're getting more like that, not less. And I think we have to, we can't lay all that blame at, at New Labour's door, but for a, gov for a government that was, you know, made these, the creative industry such a central part of its identity, I think, its political legacy, I think you do have to criticise them a bit for the fact that these sectors, these problems were there and could have been dealt with or could have been at least recognised. Um, so, to a question here, Phil. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Sean. And I, I also have to share your scepticism about the uh, DCMS figures, I have to say. Yeah. We could talk about uh, creative accounting. As well. yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, creative industries, yeah. Yeah. All yeah. accounting is creative, <laughs> um, apparently. And I'll um, include <laughs> software. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a written, yeah. Um, the question really, I suppose my thoughts, when I was thinking about the, uh, the beginning of the new labour period with creative industries, I was thinking about the sensation action with exhibition yeah. of young British artists. That was perhaps a warning sign in thinking about yeah. you know, celebrity, money, and uh, yeah. new labour. Yeah. Um, but perhaps the end period, or towards the end period, was um, uh, thinking about um, the lack of credibility in new labour, partly associated with the political landscape. And especially, I think, if you think about the moments of the G8 and Live 8 yeah. in 2005. And really, I think that was a, part, uh, there was a kind of parting of ways around that period. In some ways, a kind of loss of faith in that narrative mm -hmm. amongst the artistic and creative sector, particularly uh, associated with popular culture. And you see that separation with you know, the anti-war marches and so on yeah. um, around Iraq. So I think that's quite an important part of that, yeah. that yeah. separation that you were describing. Yeah. So, no, no. Really no. Yeah. no, 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 talking about George Osborne's speech, because one of the things that about that, or, I mean, whether or not it's written by George, George Osborne, it is, nevertheless, it's said in an autumn, in a, in a, in an autumn statement, and, that, and that those words have been used many times by people in the cultural sector to signal something. Mm -hmm. And effectively what it's signaling is the debate about whether or not culture is a, 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 um, uh, a, a credible investment mm -hmm. for the government is over. The debate is over. It's, in, it's there. Mm -hmm. The debate now is about how that money is spent. Mm -hmm. It's how it's distributed. And therefore it plays into the devolution agenda, which we've just been talking about. So um, if we can kind of summarise, mm -hmm. if you like, all mm -hmm. of this... Mm -hmm. You know, at this point that um, that new Labour's policies have led us to, in in some ways, to this point yeah. where the the culture is is kind of hardwired into yeah. the policy narrative. Yeah. Um, that n uh, the the issues are about the things that new Labour itself didn't really deal with, which yeah. is about equity. Yeah. Is is that a reasonable in some, is that in some ways a kind of reasonable assessment of the legacy of new labor or is it, uh, in some ways it, or yeah. is or is there is there something else that we should are there other things that we should be then both celebrating and critiquing about that legacy okay alongside it? yeah okay i think you're absolutely right that it made it a central part of government policy and particularly of economic policy and and and, and th therefore that, that to some degree that's over. What I would say the other thing that we might critique or at least worry about is it's the, the mirror image of the Tony Blair and, and um, um, Noel Gallagher thing was when David Cameron was on Desert Island Discs and he said he had wanted the Smiths on there and Johnny yeah. Marr immediately leapt, leapt up and said, you know, I'm refusing that you, you cannot like the Smiths. It's almost like now politicians own popular culture so much, the popular culture itself is drained of vitality. It no longer speaks to anything else. It's been taken over. You know, it's so uncool that even mm. David Cameron likes the jam and the Smiths, and you cannot go on Desert Island Disc now without saying that you like the jam and the Smiths. And, you know, everybody, the Archbishop of Canterbury was mourning about David Bowie. 
Yeah. I, mean, what could, I mean, what can popular culture now well, say I, I to us in yeah. a kind of subversive sense if the Archbishop of Canterbury is really upset about David Bowie? Actually, it's did, exhausting. Did, did, anybody, did anybody hear this? This is on a today, this is yeah. today program. So yeah. Bowie, yeah. Bowie died. Bowie, the announcement about Bowie is like 7 o'clock. And they had Justin Welby on at like 7.15. Yeah, yeah. And he was the, effectively the first person yeah. to speak about <laughs> David nation. Bowie's legacy. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's an, that's an extraordinary it thing. It struck me as an extraordinary thing, yeah. thing at the time. And I think it's an extraordinary <laughs> thing. And what I think about that is that there is something, where do we go to now for that subversive thrill? Or that or for kind of subversion? We don't get, I don't think we, somehow we don't go to popular culture anymore. And I'm just about to start a, a research project looking at kind of green economics and sort of, you know, environmental stuff for the next five years. And I suppose we look at the role of arts and culture in it. And I'm kind of wondering now whether actually all the energy is actually somewhere else. I don't want to end, end on a depressing note, but I just, <laughs> because I think the energy is somewhere. Well, Subversion is somewhere, politics is somewhere, but somehow popular culture is not what gets that energy anymore. It, it's a anymore. teaser for the next book. Okay, so look, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, the, if you get a chance to read... Uh, Eddie's um, got a free copy. Yeah, I've got you. the Culture, culture Economy, Politics, <laughs> the Case for New Labour. It's a really... Uh, excellent read. I mean, it's 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 um, it's got some some brilliant information that I wasn't aware of in it, as well as really interesting perspectives on things that we're all familiar with in one way or another. So, um, congratulations on the book. Thanks for coming along, Kate. Um, it's been it's been really interesting to talk. Um, I think uh, Roger, you're gonna you're gonna do a quick wrap up in a second. But um, I'm, well, I'm going to hand over to Roger to do the <laughs> wrap-up. <Yep. laughs> yes, I'd like to thank um, our two Liverpudlians, uh, Kate and Eddie. One's an Evertonian, one's a Liverpudlian, but we've seen their true colours this evening. <laughs> and I'm sure that I look forward to Kate's new book, which is obviously going to be called Roaming is the New Rock and Roll. <laughs> so thank you. The next ICE event as part of the Festival of Ideas is next uh, Thursday, February the 11th, when we have the UK's leading satirical novelist, Jonathan Coe, here, who will be discussing and reading from his new book, which is called Number 11. Um, again, uh, keeping uh, in spirit with discussion of politics and culture. And that's Jonathan Coe's uh, sequel to his um, um, skewering of Thatcherism in his book, What a Car Book. So that's the 11th here at 6.30. So thank you and join us for some refreshments in the atrium. Thank you.